Today is February 24th, 2022. Today, here in Kiev, where I'm currently based, Russia attacked Ukraine. So this day will go down in history as an important day for Ukrainian history. It is a war that is a, certainly a crime against, against peace, against humanity. It is very much about Russian history and Ukrainian history. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Phi Sci Conversations about Philosophy and Science. Today, we have a special guest, Serhii Plohi. Uh, Serhii is a professor of Ukrainian history at Harvard University. We scheduled this interview a while back, and it turns out that today is a sort of unhappy coincidence for the timing of our interview. Today is February 24th, 2022. Today, here in Kiev, where I'm currently based, Russia attacked Ukraine. So this day will go down in history as an important day for Ukrainian history. So I am very sad that we're having this interview on this particular day, but I'm very glad, Serhii, that you're joining me. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jacob, and uh, thank you really for being in Kyiv. Uh, these people of Ukraine that that really, really very very tragic and, and day and, and this really turning point. I, I'm I'm afraid not just Ukrainian history, but also maybe European history as well. So I really appreciate that you you were able to. Thank you very much. Speak to our, to our arrangement and do this interview. Thank you for saying that. I understand that you're originally from Ukraine, so I imagine that it's still considered part of your home. I consider Ukraine a second home for me. So this is a, a personal tragedy for both of us, I imagine. Yes, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So you are a professor of Ukrainian history at Harvard University. You've worked in many institutions around the world. I today want to get the historian's perspective on what's happening. Uh, of course, I'd like to know what's in Putin's mind, where this is going, why has he done this? But I reckon that uh, the historian's perspective can be insightful here in part because many of the arguments that come from Russian leadership are historical in nature or pseudo historical. Can you just speak to just how should we understand the present crisis? Why is it happening? Well, um, it has been framed mostly uh, in terms of uh, NATO and Russia relations with NATO and NATO expansion uh, eastward. Um, but as uh, things uh, started to unfold, uh, what it became very clear is that at least on the part of uh, Putin, uh, it is very much about history. It is very much about Russian history and Ukrainian history. And this is an important, important um, layer, an important part of that entire story that may be um, sometimes difficult to understand. And because of that has been overlooked um, in favor of the discussion of the themes that are maybe more clear, or at least there is more people who can talk to them, like, like NATO. Um, but again, the, 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 the issue the issue of uh, Russian-Ukrainian relations are at the very center of uh, the crisis and today's development certainly, certainly confirms that. Today's development are, um, again, it's, 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 it's dramatic, it's tragic. Um, it's also um, a new page in the, uh, in the war that started back in uh, 2014 with the Russian annexation of the Crimea, with the launch of the hybrid warfare in eastern Ukraine and Donbass in particular. Um, why it is a new page? Because uh, what you see today, uh, there is no any more discussion or talk about alleged civil war in Ukraine or about uh, people here or there. Um, somehow rebelling against the Ukrainian government or wanting to become part of Russia. Um, so one of the reasons for that is that that um, template, that playbook doesn't work anymore. So to agree that it worked back in uh, 2014 20, uh, and um, a little bit earlier as well. 
So it is a, a war. So it's, it is a war that was de facto announced in a speech by the Russian president. It is a war that is a, certainly a crime against, against peace, against humanity. Uh, it is also the war that um, really positions, positions um, Russia and Ukraine in a very different, in a very different light. Because um, when you listen to Vladimir Putin, uh, one of the important things in what he is saying is that Russia and Ukraine are one and the same people. And, uh, or at least Ukraine belongs to in common with Russia or Russian uh, cultural sphere. And uh, uh, you normally don't wage a war and do airstrikes. Uh, and send troops uh, against against uh, your own people, unless you consider that and, and define that as, as a civil war, which is not defined that way by, by Russia. So uh, whatever the, the argumentation is, and I would say motivation as well, uh, that that war really is deepening and widening the gap that has been emerging, especially in the course of the last uh, eight years between Russia and Ukraine. And if its goal, or at least one of its goal, to uh, somehow allegedly save the unity or keep the unity or maintain or strengthen the unity, certainly what, what you are getting here is a uh, um, really, really creation of uh, two now enemy countries, if not peoples at, at war. And I'm, I'm um, concerned that again the, the, the war the war will get worse before it will get better, and that means that uh, that the, the proponents of the of the East Slavic unity really doing everything to destroy that unity for today, for tomorrow, and maybe forever. Yeah, thank you very much. You you mentioned a number of things there that I would like to follow up on. So of course. Um, we've been living under the pretense that the war in Donbass was a civil war, but um, most people think that, of course, it was backed by uh, Russia. And now, as you say, there's no pretense at all that this is a civil war. This is an act of war from one nation to another. You mentioned this point about mm, what could be called pan-Slavism, the idea that the Russian nation and the Ukrainian nation are one and the same people. Um, and Putin has been using that as an argument for unifying the territories of Russia and Ukraine. I did want to mention for the viewers of this that you're the author of this very fine book. It's not quite in focus on my video, but I'll post a link to it, um, The Gates of Europe. So in, in this book, which is like a long durée history of Ukraine, you trace the lineages of the different peoples who have called this territory their home, and it's just massively complicated. The comings and goings of different peoples from the Vikings to the Cossacks, all the Slavic tribes, um, the Golden Horde, the Ottomans, the Germans. Um, to what extent is there anything reasonable to say about this notion of Slavic brotherhood. Um, in your book, you mentioned this notion that the Russian nation and the Ukrainian nation are sort of unfinished projects. What does that mean? Um, well, um, uh, what we see uh, being weaponized today, uh, the, the 19th century concept and idea of the existence of the big Russian nation that uh, would include uh, Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians. Um, that that uh, concept of three-partite nation was really introduced in the mid-19th uh, century, partially as a reaction to the rise of the modern Ukrainian national movement and the creation of the first political organizations. Uh, and uh, to uh, make that, that vision a reality, the imperial government back then, 
in the mid 19th century prohibited the publication uh, of Ukrainian language texts. So Bible in particular, uh, the Ukrainian version of the Bible, the primer spot for the peasantry. Um, and uh, that, that uh, prohibition was in place for uh, more than 40 years. So the attempt was to arrest the development of a separate Ukrainian nation. And uh, uh, that, that attempt eventually failed uh, in, in the middle of the World War I and revolution when Ukrainians actually declared and created a state of their own. Um, so the uh, Bolsheviks, when come to power and militarily take over Ukraine, they have to accommodate those national aspirations. Of First of all, there is a recognition that Ukrainians and, and Russians are separate nations. Second uh, well, there is a territory that is defined as the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, institutions associated with the Communist Party, originally support for the development of Ukrainian uh, language and culture. And what we see today is really return to this um, uh, conservative utopia. Uh, of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, a denial of the existence of the nation. And uh, uh, first, an attempt to use this as, as, as a way to destabilize Ukraine. That started in 2014. And now uh, it's, it's uh, used as an as a, um, ideological justification for the war on uh, Ukrainian nation. And uh, many people ask why. Uh, and uh, one of the one of the answers is certainly that the war and the, the start of the aggression back in 2014, it really uh, mobilized the Ukrainian nation within truncated borders that were left after 2014. It uh, uh, certainly uh, strengthened Ukrainian identity and its separateness from. Uh, East, Slavic, uh, um, East Slavic group or community, which includes Russians and Belarusians. And uh, uh, that war is also another attempt now for military units to arrest the development of the Ukrainian nation. One of the arguments that we've heard from Putin several days ago when he authorized the um, invasion of Donbass was that Ukraine just isn't a real country. It was a, a gift by the Bolsheviks. Um, could you spend a moment um, speaking to the viewers of this video, um, explaining why one might think that and what's wrong with thinking that? I mean, how, what, what historical argument can be articulated that warrants the idea that Ukraine is indeed a real country with a real history? Well, uh, this is, this is um, imperialist thinking for excellence, because uh, basically, according to this thinking, uh, only the um, historical nations, or in other words, the empires, um, have, have, have the right to exist today. Um, no other nation allegedly has the right, and the majority of the nations of the world are the former dependencies, colonies, um, in peripheries of the empires, very often put together from a number of, of uh, imperial, uh, imperial projects, imperial structures. So this is the norm today in the world. Look at the organization of the United Nations and look at the history. So th 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 that argument basically suggests that uh, because uh, Ukrainian territory belonged to this or that empire, to the Russian or to Austria-Hungary, that means that they don't have real legitimacy, historical legitimacy, or any other. In terms of the um, um, uh, suggestion that it's, it's the Bolsheviks that, that created Ukraine, well, uh, this, is, uh, this is quite bizarre because one thing that that interpretation does, it uh, really um, ignores or wipes out an important part of Ukrainian history 
where it's the Ukrainians who created a state. Ukrainians who created a state uh, in November of 1917 in response as a reaction to the Bolshevik takeover in Petrograd. So the, the, that happens on the 25th, 26th of October, the, the Julian calendar, and then within 10 days approximately, the Ukrainians declare their state, which at that point was autonomous state. They said they wanted to stay in federation with Russia. But that, that certainly was not what the Bolsheviks wanted. So by the beginning of 1918, you have the war that is launched by Lenin in particular against Ukraine. There is a, a Russian takeover of the Kiev and there is massacre that is happening there. Uh, with the commander of the Russian troops, Muravyov, sending a telegram to, to Lenin saying that the order has been restored in Kiev. Uh, Ukrainians declare independence in, in, in the middle of that, of that war. So first, the creation of the state, second, the declaration of independence, all of that done as a reaction and in opposition to, to the Bolshevik takeover and uh, the establishment of that regime. So that's, that's, that, 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 that's the reality. That's the truth of the situation. Mm -hmm. Now, the Bolsheviks to take over Ukraine and to keep Ukraine had to take into account all those aspirations. So at the end, there is a Soviet Union is being created where performer Ukraine is recognized and part is, is Russia. So again, uh, as, as good empire builders, they were trying to accommodate cultural and, and other aspirations of the, of the local uh, elites and local populations while really um, denying them any political voice. So that was the, 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 that was the strategy. So uh, first, the Ukrainian state is created and proclaims independence in, in resistance against the Bolsheviks. And second, the Bolsheviks are trying to um, then imitate some form of Ukraine under control. Okay. So that's about the formation of a country. Now, can we speak for a moment about the formation of the nation, of the culture? So here, as your book nicely shows, the elements of Ukrainian culture, language, the people, Ukrainian nation, the core of the Ukrainian nation goes back more than 1,000 years. Um, so can we speak about the kind of deep past of Ukraine as based in what we call the present territory of Ukraine? Sure, absolutely. Well, uh, the product of the 19th century, like the, most of the national projects, including the Russian one, but also the Polish and the uh, you build the nation is directly interconnected to land. And it's 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 an ethnic understanding of the nation, which of course then uh, puts in question all this imperial territories, possessions, borders, and so on. Um, the uh, project of the, of the Ukrainian statehood of 1917 was very much based on that model of uh, an Ukrainian nation, uh, which was um, closely associated with language and, and with the music. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, it, at the end, it turned out to be successful in terms of the creation of and maintenance of independent state, like it was the case, let's say, with the Lithuanians or with the Poles or, or with other groups who didn't have, or, or Czechoslovakia that, that emerged from the, from the ruins of, the, of Austria Hungary. And the reason for that was twofold. First of all, with that uh, arrest of the Ukrainian publishing and so on and so forth, the Ukrainian intellectuals had really very difficult way, lacked instruments to get to the to the people at large, to the population, to the peasantry. So the, the identity from that point of view was 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 not strong. And second, Ukraine historically has been a place with numerous ethnicities and numerous minorities. 
And with the Ukrainian project being mostly ethnic, those minorities were quite reluctant to support Ukrainian independence and, and allow it to, to, to strengthen and, and that state to dissolve the, the pressures and dissolve the aggression coming from Russia in particular. Uh, when you uh, move to the 1991, the fall of the Soviet Union, and the fall uh, and, and the creation of a new Ukrainian state, the model of nation has been different. So it's not uh, it, it's linked to the language, but it's not exclusivist in terms of the language. It's not all also exclusivist in terms of the ethnicity. And from that point of view, every every minority in Ukraine, the majority of that minority supported the Ukrainian independence. The overall vote for independence was 92%, but there was no group where it was less than 50% or, or region for that matter. Uh, and it's, it's the way how Ukraine withstood the, the uh, aggression, the Russian aggression of 2014 and 2015. Uh, when the aggression came with the idea that if you speak Russian language, then your Russian or your identity is Russian, you, affiliate, you, you somehow associate yourself with Russian. That worked in some areas, like in, uh, in the Crimea, where et ethnically the majority of the population were Russian, or in this uh, regions of Eastern Ukraine. But it, it failed in, in the rest of Ukraine where Ukraine mobilized uh, across this ethnic and national, uh, sorry, uh, ethnic and linguistic lines. And that's, that's what you see today as well. And the mobilization happened to the, to, to the degree that the, 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 the toolbox that was used back in 2014 turned out to be um, out of date and not effective today. So that Moscow had to reserve the to, to, to the uh, not just hybrid war, but turning hybrid war into, into a very, very real global war. Okay, thank you. So you've mentioned the fact that Ukraine has long hosted many different peoples, many different ethnicities in the territory that we now call Ukraine. One of the chapters of your book, The Gates of Europe, is called The Porous Border. Uh, so I was impressed by this aspect of Ukrainian history that you so nicely described, just the fact that so many different peoples have been coming and going through Ukraine for its long history, from you know, the Vikings to the Golden Horde, to the Ottomans, Germans. Um, so why is that? What is it about Ukraine, to use you know, Timothy Snyder's term, that makes this region the bloodlands? Why has Ukraine faced this threat to its integrity over its long history? Well, in terms of the um, different different ethnicities and different groups, um, the, um, the, 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 there is a number of reasons, but one of them is that my book is, is called The Gates of Europe. So what, uh, what that means, and of course it's a metaphor and there are different, different meanings depending on the period, but Ukraine ended up to be located uh, at the end of the Eurasian, at the Eurasian steps. And Eurasian steps, this is a huge, huge ecosystem from the um, Pacific, from the Far East, all the way to the Danube. And Ukraine right there near the Carpathian Mountains at the end, at the end of that step, the step uh, landmass that produced, of course, major, major uh, land-based empires in the Mongol Empire in particular. Um, so from that point of view, Ukraine historically was divided between the uh, steppe areas and forest areas, with forest areas being uh, the, the homeland for the um, for the settled population and nomadic nomadic groups, of course, controlling controlling the steppe. Um, Crimean Tatars would be uh, the um, last of those groups. Again, that they, they got settled. They got settled in, in the Crimea in particular, but that's 
that's the, the what, what we have today, the one group that we have today that reminds us about this long, long history of existence of the step, of the step border and step frontier. Um, I, I, I talk about different, there is a porous border, but there is also a concept of the moving frontier, like, like in the United States. And that moving frontier is, was the Ukrainian colonization of the, of, of the steppe areas that really started, started in the 17th century, but really picked up speed in the 18th and 19th century, which meant that, again, that was a land of opportunity for, for very many. For the, for the Polish elites and Lithuanian elites that would control the Ukrainian territories, to the Jewish settlers that were moving, moving into the cities and then also in the uh, in this uh, areas of step step uh, Ukraine, again, turning, turning, let's say, Odessa into one of the biggest uh, Jewish cultural centers and, 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 and economic centers and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Um, um, World War II really changed changed dramatically that that multiplicity of groups and identities. Of course, Holocaust was a major major factor, um, and uh, the, the the Poles were, for example, forcefully resettled, and Ukrainians from Poland were resettled. So, and by by the end of World War II, Ukraine was really turned with some small groups there. Yeah, Ukrainian Tatars were were forcefully resettled. So Ukraine turned into some sort of Ukrainian Russian or Russian Ukrainian continuum. So in a sense that there were two, two main groups with other groups really because of the of the situation of the war, because of the Holocaust, because of the uh, being marginalized. And what 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 you see today is uh, really that that that, that story of Russian Ukrainian relations are playing itself out, but again, it's not the issue of the tensions between the two groups in Ukraine, as they don't exist, and the groups are certainly very much united against Russian aggression today. That is the question of the relations with Russia. Okay, this actually uh, leads nicely into a question that um, I was a little bit puzzled by in Gates of Europe. Somewhere about halfway through the book, you start speaking about ethnic Russians and ethnic Ukrainians. Um, who are these people? How are they distinguished? Um, I mean, one temptation would be to dis distinguish them by language, but as you've already noted, that doesn't work so well in these borderlands, cities like Kharkiv, for example, where people will identify nationally as Ukrainian, though, you know, their, their first language is Russian. So what does it take to be an ethnic Russian, an ethnic Ukrainian? Where do they come from? What distinguishes them? Yeah, the, the, the 19th century model was, of course, the, the based on language exclusively or, or predominantly. And uh, the languages are close, but the uh, language is also far enough uh, for when the negotiations in the 17th century would be conducted between the Russian and, and Ukrainian officials, they needed interpreters. And today, most Russians would not understand Ukrainian. Uh, Ukrainians understand Russian because of the long history of certain Russification, the, the presence of the Russian Empire, and then the Soviet Union, where the official language and, and also the, uh, the, the lingua franca was, was Russian. So what happened in the 20th century with the start of urbanization and that part of modernity and part of modernization in general was that huge numbers of the peasants, Ukrainian speaking peasants were moving into the cities, which as centers of administration, centers of business were uh, linguistically Russian. Or, they, some of them were Polish in, 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 in the western part of Ukraine, but in central and in eastern Ukraine, they were Russian. And you, uh, you got a particular category, which probably was one third of the Ukrainian population, who were uh, cons uh, cons uh, considered themselves to be Ukrainians, ethnic Ukrainians in particular, but were speaking Russian. So Russian speaking Ukrainians as, 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 as a separate category which served also as a bridge between the ethnic Russians, Russian speaking ethnic Russians and Ukrainian speaking ethnic Ukrainians. 
which provided the, the, the sort of the, of the stability for the, for the Ukrainian state, which uh, restored uh, first 20, 25 years of independent existence without really mass mobilization, ethnic mobilization of any groups or minority groups in Ukraine. So Ukraine didn't have a situation of Transnistria like it happened in, in, in Moldova. Ukraine didn't have the situation of Nagorno Karabakh, the, the relations between Armenia and, and Azerbaijan. Uh, and uh, those things were really brought to Ukraine um, with the presence of the Russian troops within the Crimea or the Donbass. So without, without that aggression, uh, Ukraine would continue to be this melting pot. And, and certainly Ukraine outside of this um, territories that were annexed by Russia so far is, is the, the, the place where the ethnic and linguistic, linguistic uh, conflicts are really, really non-existent. Again, not, not that there is no tensions at all, but the conflicts are really non-existent. Okay. To what extent do you think that those linguistic tensions were a cause of some of the conflicts in Eastern Ukraine. And so for example, that, I, language I think, laws. Yeah, I, I think that they were not a cause at all. Mm -hmm. I think that they were used as an excuse uh, to, to launch an aggression. Uh, to the same degree as today, for example, the uh, words of the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, saying that, okay, Ukraine gave up its nuclear arsenal for the assurances of sovereignty and territorial integrity. And that's that's not what happened. Uh, maybe we should go back to the, the nuclear arsenal. So the, those were words which are now used as, as a pretext and as the reason to attack Ukraine. So, but it's also interesting that the language is not, is not anymore part of that, uh, that uh, vocabulary or part of that uh, toolbox for, for justification of the aggression. Okay, okay. So my questions have been jumping around historically really quite a lot in a sort of unprofessional way with respect to you know, professional standards of history. Um, but we've been speaking about the people, um, ethnic Russians and ethnic Ukrainians, and I would like to rewind the clock significantly to learn a little bit about the Slavic tribes. So who, who were the original Slavs? Where did they come from? Um, in your book, you speak of them first arising in historical records in the region roughly between the Dnieper River and the Danube. Can, can you tell us more about, about these people? Um, yeah, yes, of course. And uh, again, the, the very, very useful uh, information that we are now getting about prehistoric times of so that population is provided by language. Um, the, the analysis, for example, of the dialects and uh, the, the uh, general, general understanding today it can change in the future it is that the Slavs is a group that emerged in the uh, forested areas, also areas with marshes uh, in today's um, northwestern Ukraine, um, southern Belarus, and, and eastern Poland. Um, we don't know much about them because most of, of our knowledge comes, of course, from the educated Greeks or educated Romans. Who, uh, and again, Greek colonies would be in the Crimea. They would know something about the steppe areas, um, and uh, but the steppes were controlled not by the Slavs. The steppes were controlled by Iranian groups, by the Turkic groups later. So um, our our informers from history were cut off from those forest areas of Ukraine, Belarus, and East Poland by this nomadic tribes and whatever they were getting were, were getting very little little information but then around uh, let's say six uh, six um, hundred years of, of uh, more of common era of modern era 
um, the Slavs were uh, got strong enough to organize themselves and became one of the groups that would be attack the um, borders of the Roman Empire. And that's that's where they get in the first information, first hand information about those uh, th th those groups. Um, the, the, the irony is that we really know nothing about the way in which these groups that were formed in today's Ukraine, Belarus, and Poland eventually ended up as far south as, as Dubrovnik, or so the, the, the Serbs, the Croats, the, 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 former, the former Yugoslavia. Um, so the historical sources are mostly silent, but somehow they Land, well, what we know today, and also the linguistic data tells us that they that they have to migrate somehow. Most likely, they were migrated in the in, 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 in relatively peaceful way because war is not going to be being recorded and discussed. Uh, so, and as as this settle, resettlement of the of the uh, Slavs was happening, of course, the differences in the languages were emerging, and so on and so forth. So. There is a belief that there was some form of the Protestant language. Uh, and uh, today, uh, the, the, not just today, already for more than uh, 150 years, the, the, the Slavs are divided in very general terms into Southern Slavs, and uh, those would be mostly the uh, peoples and countries of the former Yugoslavia and Bulgaria. And then there would be Western Slavs with Czechs and Slovaks and Poles, and Eastern Slavs with Ukrainians, uh, Belarusians, and Russians. So that's that's the, 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 that's the general idea about about the, the history history of the Slavs before the formation of the modern nations. Okay, so that grouping of Eastern Slavs could provide some basis for. A kind of brotherhood thesis. <laughs> if well, that, 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 that is that, that, that is certainly the, the argument was behind the idea first of the existence of one single Russian nation, yeah. and then about the, the this common common ground and common cultural and linguistic space for for the for the uh, Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians in the nineteenth century. Uh, but certainly what we what we see and what the linguists found uh, uh, when they went to talk to those people in the 19th century was this three different already linguistic groups that existed uh, that existed at that time. I'll, I'll give you one example that there is no really linguistic border between today's Russia and Belarus in most places because the population didn't move there. It's forested areas, it's marshed areas. That's the original homeland of the Slavs. What you see there are the transitional dialects from what was later codified as Ukrainian and Belarusian. But uh, when you move to the to Eastern Ukraine around Kharkiv, we were talking about Kharkiv, if you go to the villages there, you will see very clear this village is a Ukrainian and this village is Russian. Because that, that step frontier around Kharkiv, the population movement was happening there already in the 17th century. By the time when this uh, different, different uh, dialects really developed into, into quite, quite different languages. So again, you, you, you can't see a clear line, dividing linguistic line between uh, most of Ukraine and Belarus, and you see very clear uh, uh, line linguistic between Ukrainian and Russian settlements, including, including in Donbass. Um, there were uh, reports from the, from the uh, 2014 of some of the uh, Ukrainian officers and soldiers who were fighting there, and uh, I just it stayed with me one you know, comment by, by one of them saying that, well, uh, we found ourselves in, in the village and we were not, we couldn't figure out right away whether it was Russian or Ukrainian village, right? So, but eventually we figured out. But, but this is the question that would, would not be asked in, 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 the, in, the, in the Ukrainian Belarusian 
what are the because again that there would be there would be no clear difference in the industry. Okay. As 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 you move closer in Ukraine and in Belarus toward the more central areas whose dialects serve as the basis for the modern Ukraine and the Belarusian certainly that's the difference goes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask you about the figure of Yaroslav, Yaroslav the Wise, who is a key figure in both Ukrainian history and Russian history, and his you know, post-mortem fate as itself an interesting mystery. Can you tell us who Yaroslav was and why is he so important to the histories of Ukraine and Russia? Well, um, Yaroslav was one of the most prominent uh, princes or kings of this in state that for historians today is known as Kievan Rus. So um, in, in terms of his background, dynastic ties and so on and so forth, he was part of the, of the uh, Vikings dynasty and Vikings related history of Europe. So it's, it's very, from that point of view, very familiar European story. Um, and uh, uh, the, the issue is that uh, his, his legacy is contested, um, in, uh, in particular between, between Ukraine and Russia, because in the Russian historical narrative, Russia comes out of Kiev, comes out of Kiev and has exclusive rights in Kiev legacy. So um, the monument to Yaroslav the Wise, in, in, is in particular in the city of Nizhny Novgorod in Russia, but generally is celebrated. And in that way, he ended up in the Russian uh, banknotes and, 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 and the currency. And uh, you have also Yaroslav the Wise on the Ukrainian currency. And I discussed that in the book that in, in uh, uh, Ukrainian incarnation, he is portrayed with the Cossack type of moustache. And uh, in, in the Russian, he is portrayed more like a Russian Tsar of the 16th century with a beard. Um, so it's, it's the question of the, of the um, legacy of, of Kievan Rus, whom, whom Kievan Rus belongs to. And uh, modern, the consensus in modern scholarship is that really it's too early to talk about either Russians or Ukrainians being there already in the 11th or in the 12th century. Um, that the Kievan Rus didn't have one nationality, so it was not a modern state. They were different tribes and different dialects and so on and so forth. But at, at the end of the day, the, the fact is that Kiev, the, the ancient capital of Kievan Rus today is the capital of, of Ukraine. And back in the 19th century, that of course presented uh, the, the fact that people in and around Kiev spoke Ukrainian and didn't speak Russian presented a major challenge to the Russian historiography and, and Russian ideologues at that time. How, how come that the birthplace of Russia that people don't speak Russian there, but speak Ukrainian, which says points of course in the direction that okay, we're dealing with mythology here rather than, than, than some reality. But to, to explain and, and to make that mythology believable, the, the argument was put forward that, well, uh, as the result of the Mongol invasion, um, the Russians who lived in Kiev and spoke Russian, they outmigrated to the north. And that area was populated by other groups and other tribes. And for decades, there was a long debate between Russian and Ukrainian historians, with Ukrainian historians uh, trying to point out that there was that uh, the sources don't, historical sources, don't tell us anything about big out migration from, from that area. And you move a little bit further from Kiev and you see those ancient dialects. That's, that's the origins, the, 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 the homeland of the Slavs, is this dialects, transitional dialects between Ukrainians and Belarusians, which points to the fact that, okay, there was no major population movement in that area since, since time in memorial. Mm -hmm. But again, we deal with the very powerful myth of origins of, of, uh, in today's Russia, which of course links its origins to Kiev. 
uh, it, it's uh, um, in terms of dynasty, yes, absolutely, the Kiev dynasty also gave princes to what to what later became Russian. Uh, but in the in the language of the 19th century and 20th century uh, history, uh, hi historiography, when people are talking about nations and languages and cultures and things like that, uh, the, the, the dynastic um, uh, theory, the, 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 the dynastic connection can explain only a certain part of the, of the history, not, not its entirety. Mm -hmm. Can dynastic explanations apply to what's happening today. Sometimes in Western media, we read about uh, Putin having a view about Imperial Russia and having sort of dynastic ambitions. Um, is that part of what's happening? Well, I, I uh, don't exclude that in general, in terms uh, that how the, the Russian uh, historical narrative was formed, of course, those dynastic foundations are extremely important. Uh, but in terms of what, what Putin is saying and what he is writing, uh, he is a believer more in, in the nation and nationality. Mm -hmm. um, his argument is that Ukrainians don't exist as a separate nationality. So mm -hmm. you, you, didn't have, you didn't have the right dynasty, you didn't have the right. But, um, you are really Russians, you just don't know that. You don't understand. Okay, okay. We have been, of course, focusing on history and um, the long, difficult history of Ukraine. I would like to ask you to speculate a little bit about the future. What, in your mind, could Ukraine do to help preserve? its national and territorial identity? Uh, well, uh, Ukraine, um, before a few days ago, everyone was asking the question whether Ukraine would resist. And so today we, we got, unfortunately, we got the answer to this question, so Ukraine, Ukraine resists. And I think that that resistance will continue. I, I can't predict the future. But uh, looking at the history of the situations of that kind, uh, one thing uh, emerges quite clear for me is that uh, we are dealing here with an attempt of the former uh, imperial power to reestablish its control over the former territories and former subjects, denying their right to exist and denying their, their nationhood and their separate identity. And uh, we know we can't predict every case, but we know the general tendency. That the, um, the age of empires it came to an end, that we are in the age of the uh, really um, modern states, rising modern states on the, on the ruins of those empires. And in that sense, that's, that's the one context and one trajectory in which we can put um, in today's developments. And uh, another, another context is the context of the war. And wars in general uh, work as a mobilizing force for nations, uh, whether they lose them or whether they fund those wars. These are, this are the key moments in the formation of, of nations. And if you look back at the last eight years since the start of the Russian aggression in uh, 2014, it is very clear that that hybrid war, uh, or sometimes not so hybrid, but the really non frozen conflict in, in Eastern Ukraine, it contributed enormously to the um, mobilization of Ukraine to the formation of the Ukrainian identity to a degree that it, it can't be, the, 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 the tensions within it could not be exploited anymore as a, as a way to, to start the war. And uh, uh, again, that's that's the, the, the trend that I think will continue in Ukraine. Okay. For my last question, Serhii, I just want to um, 
make it a kind of open-ended question. Is there any uh, important angle from the historian's perspective that we haven't touched on that you that you would like to discuss? Well, uh, I think that that language, uh, the, the, the questions were quite comprehensive, and I'm, I'm really grateful to you for for, for, uh, to, for, for asking those questions. Um, one maybe final point that I want to make is the point that uh, there is one more context which is linked and connected to the to the history of the uh, fall of the empires. And this is the, that that particular context is called the uh, fall of the Soviet Union. And uh, like it has been the case with other empires, it uh, didn't happen overnight. It is a long process, and we are now watching the, the continuation of that process. And back in 1991, we all believed, and, and or at least were hopeful, that that last empire fell without a major bloodshed. There was a war within the Russian Federation with Chechnya, but that at that time there was no war between the biggest republics. Armenia and Azerbaijan were fighting the war, but not, not Russia, not Ukraine. And uh, today we are in that, in that situation of the, of the war, the open warfare. And uh, that is that is the, 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 again, the, the story of, of the fall of the disintegration of the communist regime of the uh, Soviet Union. Uh, part of it again in Ukraine, you can't find today monuments to Lenin, but they were there back in 2013. So it's it's a very very long and very painful goodbye also to the Soviet part of history. Thank you for that. Uh, so before we close, I do want to just tell the viewers of this video uh, that uh, you have written a number of books on Ukrainian history. So Sergei has written a book about uh, the Chernobyl crisis. He's written a book about the Cuban Missile Crisis. The book that we've been speaking about largely today is called The Gates of Europe, which I've just finished reading and it's had a huge impact on me. Uh, so I highly recommend everybody to buy this book and read it. Uh, Serhi, I want to thank you very much for this conversation. Diakuyu za razmovu. Diakuyu vam, thank you very much. And uh, uh, thanks, Jacob, for, for being now in Kiev. And please stay safe. Thank you very much.